Well, hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Ashmit Kumar and here are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. The last street ends lower for a second day in a row. Nifty and Sensex end the session at over one month lows. BSE companies erase a market cap of nearly 7 lakh crore rupees in just two days. Broader markets underperform. Reliance Retail acquires wholesale food products company Metro Cash in Cali, India for at 28.50 crore rupees. The move will enhance Reliance Retail's physical presence and bring a large number of Kiranas, wholesale customers and suppliers into its fold. A parliamentary committee calls for an ex-ante framework to identify anti-competitive practices in digital markets before they get monopolized. The committee says that players capable of negatively influencing markets must be identified, mentions 10 anti-competitive practices that competition law must address. राज्यों को कोविड वैक्सीन की प्रिकॉशन डोज बढ़ाने पर और लोगों को प्रिकॉशन डोज की अहमियत के प्रति जागरूकता लाने के लिए भी कदम उठाना चाहिए Prime Minister Modi chairs a high-level meeting on COVID situation. Health Minister Mansukh Manviya tells the Parliament that the Ministry has advised states to strengthen surveillance, conduct genome sequencing of positive samples and considering 2% random sampling of all international passengers at airports. World Health Organization chief says it is very concerned over the COVID situation in China, appeals for detailed information on severity of the disease, hospital admissions and intensive care requirements. As per WHO data, the country has reported over 23,000 new cases in just the last 24 hours. Karnataka High Court sets aside income tax department's seizure order on Shami India's fixed deposits worth 3,700 crore rupees says the taxman's order against the smartphone maker was arbitrary and revealed a preconceived conclusion. The battle is not only for life, freedom and security of Ukrainians or any other nation which Russia attempts to conquer. This struggle will define in what world our children and grandchildren will live Ukraine President Zelensky receives a standing ovation at the U.S. Congress, appeals to U.S. lawmakers for more assistance in the war against Russia, expresses gratitude for American support, tells them, and I quote, your money is not charity. Sam Bankman-Fried extradited to the U.S. to face multiple charges in the FTX collapse. Two of the FTX founders' colleagues plead guilty to fraud-related charges. Well, those were the headlines that we're tracking this evening. Let's now toss over to Shireen Bhan, who's joined by a very special guest. Over to you, Shireen. Well, thanks very much, Ashman. Joining us now is the new president of FIKI, Shubhrakant Panda. He joins us now to discuss the state of the economy and, of course, the upcoming budget. Shubhrakant, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us. And to start with, congratulations on taking over as president of FIKI. Uh, let me start by asking you about this. Uh, Thank you, Shireen. Uh, the COVID scare, uh, you know, there are meetings that are taking place. The government has issued advisories. The IMA has issued an advisory. Uh, is there a fear within industry uh, that restrictions of some sort uh, could be brought back? So, uh, so Shireen, uh, you know, for the last uh, day and a half, I guess, we have been hearing a lot of news coming out of China about, uh, you know, the supposed uh, unrestrained uh, spread of covid uh, they have reversed their zero COVID policy, but have done it in a manner which is, you know, sort of uh, an abrupt uh, lifting of restrictions. But uh, like I have been, I mean, my view is that, uh, you know, I don't think we should panic. And uh, more than anything else, I think one has to wait and watch uh, for the next few days as to, you know, what is the information flowing out? Because that's a country, that's a society where there's a, a lot of regulation on, on, on news flowing out. So I would much rather, you know, wait for, a, you know, more information, a bit more authentic information. But having said that, I must commend the government for being proactive uh, with the health secretary uh, writing to, to all the states and stakeholders to, to, uh, to be vigilant, to, uh, to do genome sequencing, which I think is very important in order to catch uh, any uh, you know, new uh, strains. But uh, you know, more for the Chinese people uh, and as much as for the world, I would really hope that uh, this is something that is under control. Because from an industry perspective, of course, uh, 
you know, there, uh, uh, there could be the possibility of, uh, of uh, more supply chain disruptions, which we can hardly afford uh, if this does spiral out of control. But I would prefer not to speculate at this point in time. And we must, of course, keep in mind that it's the, you know, it's the human cost that is, uh, that, uh, that is more relevant than anything else. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think uh, more for the Chinese people as, as for the rest of the world. I hope that, uh, that you know, this is not something which is out of control and most of the cases are mild. But from our point of view, uh, at this point in time, uh, I think it's more about remaining vigilant, which is what the government is doing. Um, you know, the government of India has conducted the world's largest vaccination drive. So about, uh, you know, close to 100 percent of the population is, uh, is vaccinated with two doses, a large number with uh, the third precautionary dose. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a degree of herd immunity, I, I believe, with, uh, you know, previous infections. So I wouldn't panic at this point in time. But, uh, of course, vigilance is, yes. is the, is the uh, need of the hour. No, absolutely. Very appropriately put. Uh, there is no cause for panic at this point in time. Uh, the overall cases in India, uh, over 150 at this point in time in terms of active cases. Yes, there is need to be vigilant, uh, but there is no cause for any panic. And uh, please don't go by any of these WhatsApp messages that are doing the round on how virulent the new strain in China is and how deadly it is and so on and so forth. Those are misleading messages. And once again, we're urging all of our viewers uh, to uh, to you know verify before forwarding uh, messages and and these messages have been doing the rounds since morning it, it only causes panic uh, and creates Absolutely. confusion uh, but Shubhrakant uh, you know we're almost at the end of 2022 and uh, uh, you know it continues to be a fairly challenging global environment even back home uh, the festive season is over. There are concerns on whether demand is going to continue to hold up. We have, of course, seen rates moving higher as well. What's the overall mood within industry at this point in time? Well, you know, if I were to take you back a little bit to the start of the pandemic, where I believe both the timing and the quantum of the stimulus measures were, were spot on, because world over, we have seen an excess of stimulus has led to elevated uh, uh, inflation, which is more stubborn. From that point of view, India has had a much better time. I mean, we did have a fight with inflation, but uh, that was by and large imported. And with, uh, you know, commodity prices uh, cooling off um, in the last couple of quarters, we have seen uh, inflation come within the tolerance band of, uh, of the central bank. And, and that is something that to be, to be quite uh, happy about. I mean, of course, uh, I do agree with the... With, uh, you know, with the governor, that uh, it's it's uh, it's not something that we can assume that uh, that it's uh, it's over. I mean, uh, I think the worst is behind us, but one has to be vigilant um, uh, about inflation. But having said that, uh, you know, the focus must now shift uh, squarely to growth. Uh, and I mean, for the for FY23, India is of course uh, you know at about seven percent growth, uh, the fastest growing large economy. But I think going ahead, we will have. Um, a little bit of a challenge on our hands and, uh, you know, some short term turbulence, as I have been saying, for the simple reason that global growth is going to uh, slow down sharply. Uh, I'm sure you are aware of the IMF uh, forecast that, um, you know, global growth, which uh, stood at uh, 6% for 2023, is going to nearly halve to 3.2% in 20, uh, 2023 mm. and uh, further uh, to 2.7% in 2024. And, uh, you know, as well as India has done, uh, we are neither an island nor are we decoupled from the rest of the world. And that is something that that we have to be, uh, you know, we have to watch with a little bit of caution. But we are about as well prepared as we have ever been for a situation of this uh, of this sort. And um, and even the, you know, even the I mean, let alone the, the World Bank's uh, upgradation of uh, growth for projections for the current year, uh, even for next year, the growth forecast is between 6.1 to 6.5 percent, which will again make us the fastest growing large economy, which is really commendable. But, uh, you know, the, the effect is there for, for uh, I mean, in terms of, for example, exports, where after a period of sustained uh, uh, increase in, in, in exports and merchandise exports uh, crossing the $400 billion mark last year to set a new record, we, are, we have seen uh, headwinds. And that is a reflection of the second degree uh, impact, so to say, of, uh, of persistent inflation and uh, uh, in, in Europe and, and, and the U.S., and not to mention, of course, I think uh, one-third of the global economy, if I'm not mistaken, is, is facing recession, uh, which is uh, two consecutive quarters of negative growth. So India is, is well prepared. Uh, I mean, India is in a, in a sweet spot, yeah. but we, uh, you know, we certainly have to be sort of, um, you know, uh, navigate uh, uh, through a, a year or so of uh, short-term turbulence while keeping our eye 
on the tremendous opportunity that India represents over the medium to long term. Uh, you know, Shubhakant, uh, speaking of uh, events coming up in the near term, we've got the budget around the corner. Uh, one of the specific recommendations that Fiki made was that the government should uh, uh, give out the concessional tax rate of 15% to corporations for the next five years. The sun sets on that in 2024. Uh, it's already been given a one-year extension by the government. Now, in my conversation with the former Revenue Secretary, Tarun Bajaj, he was very clear. He said, look, industry needs to come to us and put down a number and give us an assurance of what they're going to invest for us to consider extending uh, the timeline. The, pri the, the finance minister again in parliament reiterating, asking the private sector uh, to step up and invest. So, uh, you know, in light of the fact that uh, given that there was this concessional rate available, yet we haven't seen any significant pickup in private capex, what's the expectation? Well, you know, I will be the first one to admit that, uh, you know, you haven't seen, uh, uh, you know, the private sector capex uh, over the last uh, year, year and a half. And I think that is a reflection of, uh, of both the pandemic period and the aftermath, where obviously there were some, you know, some growth concerns. Uh, but, um, you know, the point I made when we had the conversation about, uh, about extending this for five years is that today, I think with, uh, with uh, the PLI schemes and, and other uh, uh, other measures uh, aimed at, uh, you know, enhancing the ease of doing business and reducing the cost of doing business. I think India is an ideal destination to attract investment, especially global supply chains looking to move to to move out of China. Uh, and I think a live example of that is at a time when China has had disruption, uh, mobile phone uh, exports out of India have shot up, and that's a real live example of uh, of uh, what we can achieve and why why there is a need for uh, global corporations to consider an alternate to China. Now, you know, getting back to the point about the fact that there hasn't been enough investment, um, uh, we have to keep in mind that when global supply chains look to move, uh, it, it's, not a decision, it's not a decision which is uh, taken easily and it takes time to implement. And that is why we believe the, that, a, that a window of five years which provides some certainty would help in attracting investment. But coming to the point about, uh, about private sector uh, investment, um, you know, this I, I, I do uh, uh, um, agree that it is something which needs to pick up. I commend the government for the heavy lifting they have done during the pandemic period and its aftermath. It was absolutely necessary to support the economy, to shore it up. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, the fact that, uh, that it has continued, I believe, will now start crowding in private sector investment. But the data, if you look at it, I mean, for Q2 of, of FY23, uh, the value of, of uh, new project announcements is about uh, 3.3 trillion, which is uh, you know more than the 2.7 uh, trillion in Q2 of uh, of FY22, and, and noticeably more than uh, the 1.2 trillion in uh, Q2 of FY21. So there is an upward trajectory, and not to mention uh, you know there is also some hidden private sector capex, if I can call it that, because mm -hmm. nearly 8 trillion rupees worth of projects which were you know, either uh, either stuck up or uh, or uh, you know uh, not operating at, at optimum capacity because they were in NCLT. You know, these assets have changed hands. There is investment going in mm. to debottleneck and and increase production or increase output and bring idle assets back online. So you know, there is private sector investment happening. And I'd like just like to take a minute to share another point, which is uh, the the latest manufacturing survey that uh, that Fiki put out, which was again pertaining to Q2. Um, showed that, you know, the capacity utilization on average is about 70 percent. Hmm. And, you know, normally the belief is that if you hit about 80 odd percent, that's when you see uh, uh, investment come in. But what the 70 percent uh, sort of covers is that there are certain sectors like automobiles and paper products, etc., which are operating at 90 to 95 percent. And that's where you are seeing announcements being made. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are also sectors which are which are 50 to 60 percent capacity utilization and the slack needs to be taken up first before you you see any new announcement. So I think private sector investment is happening. It's more than a trickle. It is gaining momentum. And I believe that it's headed in the right direction. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, government capex uh, continuing will, will crowd in, as I mentioned and uh, overall start the virtuous cycle. You know, a final question before I let you go, uh, and very quickly, Shubhrakant, I, I would imagine that there's been uh, consultations with the government on the IBC. Uh, while it has done its job, uh, there are amendments that are now likely to be brought in as far as the IBC is concerned. Uh, any, any check on what industry believes 
needs to change by way of amendments? Well, I'm, I'm not very up to date uh, on, on, uh, on, on this aspect, but certainly we have had consultations. But, you know, keep in mind that, you know, IBC is a very, very important piece of legislation. Uh, it has certainly brought, brought about discipline in, in, in borrowing because, you know, you can't, you can't uh, take things for granted anymore and, and go out on a, on a, on a limb and say that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how things pan out. Uh, there are very real consequences for, uh, for defaults and as it should be. Um, but, you know, in as much as the legislation itself is concerned, as I said, it's a very important piece of legislation. Uh, it, it's still, you know, relatively in its early days, if I were to call it that, uh, in, in terms of precedences being set. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that, uh, you know, the highest judicial authority, for example, the, the Honorable Supreme Court has clarified uh, time and again that, um, uh, you know, when ownership changes hands, then, then a lot of the, lot of the mess that, that was created gets left behind so that, uh, you know, the new, uh, you know, sort of the new owner operator can, can uh, proceed unhindered. But these are, you know, there are still, uh, I mean, occasionally you have um, issues coming up in terms of uh, older, uh, you know, demands or statutory dues or something of that right. sort coming up. So uh, I think most of, uh, I think most of our suggestions have centered around ensuring that there is a clean break between, uh, you know, between uh, what happened in the past and the attempt to revive. Mm. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the focus must be on maximizing value for, uh, for creditors. But I believe there is, you know, there is perhaps a little bit of uh, need to look at uh, issues like operational creditors, especially the, you know, the, the small creditors, the MSME sectors, uh, without necessarily right. impinging upon the rights of, uh, of secured uh, creditors. But, uh, you know, these are the sort of... Um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, methodology to arrive at, uh, at, uh, at sure. uh, the best valuation and, and, uh, and allow for as many competitive bids to come in. Right. So these are the sort of, uh, you know, recommendations we have made. But I must confess that, you know, I'm not up to date on, on, uh, on the exact points that we have, we have covered on this. Shubhakant, always a pleasure. Appreciate you joining us. And we wish you the very best of luck uh, as uh, you start your tenure Thank you. as the president of Piki. Appreciate your time. Well, uh, I'm going to toss it back to Ashmit for all the other news. Ashmit. Right, Shireen, thanks a lot for that. So there you have it, the new Fiki chief laying out the agenda ahead of the budget. But with that, it's time now for uh, slipping into a very short break. But coming up on the other side, Reliance Retail acquired... Welcome back. Reliance Retail has taken yet another step in expanding its empire. It has signed a definitive agreement to acquire a 100% stake in Metro Cash and Carry. The deal will be sealed at a cash consideration of over 2,800 crore rupees. Now, through this acquisition, Reliance Retail will have access to the company's outlets and the retail and institutional buyers. Manglam Maluna joins us uh, with more details. Uh, Manglam, uh, quickly take us through the contours of this deal and how it stands to benefit Reliance Retail. Well, the news is official now. Uh, the, the company has informed the exchanges of them purchasing Metro Cash and Carries India business. The deal was struck at a value of 2,850 odd crores. A little about Metro Cash and Carry. Of course, it's uh, the Indian subsidiary of uh, the global leading international food wholesaler. It entered India in 2003 and it was the first to introduce the cash and carry business to India itself. Uh, where do the metrics for that company stand now? They have 31 large format stores. FY22 revenue was close to around 7,700 crores and they sell to Kiranas and other small businesses as wholesalers. And this is where Reliance sees benefits. The biggest benefit they get, they further send, strengthen their physical uh, store footprint. They give access to a wide network of Metro India's stores in prime locations. But importantly, they also get access to a large base of regi registered Kiranas and institutional customers and a strong supplier network. And that exactly has been the case for Reliance where they are eyeing the entire ecosystem. Analysts are looking at the scalability and synergies in this deal and importantly also eyeing whether there would be any horizontal or vertical expansion of Metro Cash and Carry, which currently is into wholesale. Can it actually go ahead into retail or not? And that will be important because Reliance recently launched their FMCG brand Independence with a wide array of products like edible oils, pulses, grains, packaged food, etc. And it's this ecosystem that everyone is uh, playing on. The Independence brand, of course, first launches in Gujarat, then scales nationally. And this asset will be important for them 
to uh, you know scale that business nationally as well they've been growing through acquisitions and tie-ups this year itself there was you know brands like socio campa cola pret a uh, brought by reliance and this over and above the near 10000 crore investment that the company did in FY22. And of that, some of the important ones included the likes of 7-Eleven, Just Style. We had a bunch of designer brands that came in and Dunzo too. So what does all of this mean for Reliance? The big, uh, uh, you know, uh, the big ambition that Mukesh Ambani had given in the annual general meeting, they're saying that Reliance Retail will become the largest segment within the group. The company goes ahead and puts their money towards acquisitions. 2850 crores for a 7,700 crore, uh, 7, crore rupee sales brand Metro, not particularly bad. Analysts would just eye scalability and synergies. Prime Minister Narendra Modi held a high-level meeting to review the COVID situation in the country. The meeting comes amidst a spike in COVID cases in some nations, including China, South Korea, Japan, as well as uh, U.S. Now, Health Minister Mansukh Manvia gave a statement in the parliament. He said that the ministry is keeping an eye on the COVID situation and taking necessary steps. The health minister urged that people must use masks and maintain social distancing ahead of the festive season. राज्यों को भी स्थानीय स्तर पर सामुदायिक निगरानी बढ़ाने के लिए और कोविड को नियंत्रित करने के लिए सलाह दी जा रही है राज्यों को जीनोम सीक्वेंसिंग बढ़ाकर सभी पॉजिटिव केसों का जीनोम सीक्वेंसिंग करने की सलाह दी गई है आने वाले त्योहार और नए साल को ध्यान में रखते हुए राज्यों को सतर्क रहकर लोगों का मास्क पहनना हैंड सैनिटाइजर करना रिस्पायरेटरी हाइजीन का ख्याल रखना और सामाजिक दूरी बनाए रखने की जागरूकता लानी चाहिए in some international news now, Ukraine is alive and kicking and will never surrender. That's the word coming in from Ukraine President Zelensky in his address to the U.S. lawmakers on his first foreign trip since Russia's invasion. He also categorically stated that U.S.'s military's aid was not charity, but rather an investment in security for the future. Alice Barr from NBC News is here with this special report. A standing ovation tonight for Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who left the front lines of his war-torn country on a high-stakes mission to secure more military aid from the U.S. Congress. Your money is not charity. It's an investment in the global security and democracy. Dressed in his signature fatigue-style sweatshirt and cargo pants, the Ukrainian leader evoking America's struggles for freedom as his soldiers fight on against a brutal Russian invasion. We Ukrainians will also go through our war of independence and freedom with dignity and success. President Zelensky bringing a flag signed by soldiers holding the line. Ukraine didn't fall. Ukraine is alive and kicking. The Ukrainian president's first foreign trip since the invasion began comes as lawmakers race to pass a massive funding bill that includes more than $45 billion in Ukrainian military and economic aid. The stirring speech comes after Zelensky met with President Biden in the Oval Office, bringing home promises of support to make it through a hard winter. The light of our faith in ourselves will not be put out. Hope, the greatest weapon this Christmas in Ukraine. And well, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Business 360. Thanks so much for watching. Stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. The news and updates will continue.